by still waters hallelujah you are savior you are my only hope your kindness is my friend and in your presence you Listen, I want you to do me a favor over the next couple of weeks. I want you to uh, start inviting your friends to services the second Sunday in March. Our uh, youth will be bringing the program for us that morning. We're going to have family night supper that night. I hope you'll bring uh, a big crowd with you. Then the next Sunday, which is Palm Sunday, the third Sunday in March, the choir will be presenting uh, the Easter cantata to us. So I'm not preaching, and that ought to be well enough to say, hey, come on, my preacher's not preaching, and uh, come listen to the gospel through song and hear the good news. <clears throat> but then, the most celebrated day on the history of planet Earth, besides the day when Christ was born, is the day that Jesus rose again from the dead. Amen. We're going to be celebrating Easter, and I'm, I'm praying for and hoping for a packed house. We all know someone who could hear the news about Jesus. Amen? Amen. I've got several friends that I know that, that aren't saved, and I'm, I'm talking with them and trying to encourage them to come and be a part of Easter service. <clears throat> Because as we've been learning this month, that uh, we have a God who is crazy in love with us. Man, is he ever. Well, if you look in your bulletins, once again, there's a handout. It's front and back, so go ahead and look at it. <laughs> it's just on the front, one side. I'm sorry. <clears throat> I could have put front and back, but I didn't. But you see the scriptures there we're going to be looking at. When you find Psalm 103, uh, we're also stick your finger in Hosea chapter 3. We're going to stand this morning as we read God's word in Psalm 103 and then Hosea chapter 3. David writes in Psalm 103, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. Who forgiveth all thine iniquities, who healeth all thy diseases, who redeemeth thy life from destruction, who crowneth thee with loving kindness and tender mercies. 
We've already looked at forgiving, a forgiving love, a healing love. Today is going to be our redeeming love. With that being said, flip over to Hosea chapter 3. We'll begin reading in verse 1. Then said the Lord unto me, Go yet, love a woman beloved of her friend, yet an adulteress, according to the love of the Lord toward the children of Israel, who looketh to other gods and love flagons of wine. So I bought her to me for 15 pieces of silver and for a homer, homer of barley and a half homer of barley. And I said unto her, Thou shalt abide for me many days. Thou shalt not play the harlot, and thou shalt not be for another man. So will I also be for thee. Father, today we, we just pause to humble ourselves before you. Lord, we're praying that you would bless the reading of your word this morning. And Father, that our minds are being shut out on things of today. One problem we have in our society today, Lord, is we're just too busy. God, I pray that we would not think on those things of today, but Lord, we're focused on you this morning. Lord, we pray that you would anoint our ears to hear this morning what you have to say to us. Father, I pray the same for myself, but also, Lord, that you would anoint your servant this morning, Lord, to just speak your word truthfully. Lord, that there will be nothing held back that you would want for us to give because of this flesh. Father, we just ask today that you would speak volumes of truth to us this morning. Lord, that you are so crazy in love with us that you want to redeem us. Lord, we thank you. Lord, I thank you for the message and song that we've just heard and for that messenger. Oh, what a Savior. What a Savior we have this morning. And Lord, we're going to give you praise in Jesus' name. Thank you. You may be seated this morning. Well, as we looked in Psalm 103, we've been talking about crazy love that God has for us. And God does have a crazy love for you. He is not crazy, but his love is crazy. And so how is that? Because he loves us with an everlasting love. And today we're going to look at the third part of this out of Psalm 103. We learned uh, two weeks ago that, that God loves us with a forgiving love. <clears throat> there is nothing that we have done to him that he is not standing ready and willing and able to forgive. And in that, he wants to forgive us of our sins so that we can be in a right relationship with him and so that the, we in turn can begin to live a life of forgiveness for others. We can't forgive anyone. Only God through us can forgive a person. Amen. Then we looked last week at the healing love of God. I believe God wants to heal. I truly do. Amen. And we know that eventually in the end, one day we will be healed completely. Hallelujah. I still love the, my song director over in uh, Mississippi, Brother Gary. Brother Gary Miller, I love that guy. Uh, before we got there several years ahead, struck by 7,500 volts of electricity in a bucket truck working on a power line. Knocked him 200 yards across the field. Lost both legs and one arm. That guy lived like he had everything intact. Farmed, bailed 10,000 bales a year. Didn't let those things stop him. <laughs> when we get to heaven, he knows this. And he, even in his own testimony, he said, one day I'm going to have my legs back. One day I'm going to have my arm back. One day I'm going to have my fingers that I lost on the other hand. There you got. You know, and that's the right attitude for us to have. We're going to be healed one day, but I believe God is still in the business of healing today, now. I believe he's healing people left and right. Now, I'm not going to step in the way. I'm going to let him do his work. I'm just going to have faith and believe that God heals. That's right. And he's going to do it. And now today we're going to look at the third part of this crazy love because these are not different crazy loves. This is just God's love. It has all these aspects about it that blows us away. 
We see there, and on your handout, you see that the Hebrew word redeemeth means ga'al, or it's pronounced that way. It's mentioned uh, in that one form 104 times in the Old Testament. And it means to redeem, to act as kinsman redeemer. Hello, brings back the story of Ruth, right? The kinsman redeemer, the ransom. And God's crazy love for us has gone to great lengths to buy us back or to redeem us from destruction. Now, what is that destruction? I believe it's twofold. Destruction he's talking about is that eternally, that we spend eternity in hell, ever separated from God. Hell is not hell because it's hot. Hell is hell because it's separation. Oh, yeah. And also, to redeem us from a life of destruction. There are so many people today whose lives are being destroyed because of sin. Amen. But God is in the business of redeeming. God is in the business of redeeming people left and right. Now, when we look into the story of Hosea, I love this story. Man, it is awesome. You can find so much in the book of Hosea about what God is like. But when we go back to chapter 1, we see that Hosea, the literal name Hosea, means salvation. Hosea means salvation. If you look in chapter 1, verse 2, I think it is, he tells uh, Hosea to go and marry uh, a wife of whoredoms in a people of whoredoms. Now, I want you to pause here and stop and listen to this. His wife that he's marrying, <laughs> I don't know how we got Gomer. Uh, I don't know about you, but I just don't know that I could marry a, a woman by the name Gomer. <laughs> I said, golly, you know. <laughs> That's what I got pictured in mind. She's saying, golly, shazam. <laughs> I know some of y'all now think he done lost his rocker this morning. Huh? But I mean, just the name Gomer is kind of hard for me to get past. But when Hosea married Gomer, she was not a prostitute at that time. I don't believe that she was. It was not until after marriage that she left her husband to become an adulterer. I believe that she was just an Israelite because all of Israel God saw was uh, idolaters. That's what he says in that passage. He doesn't say that she was a prostitute in the beginning. She was just one of the whoredoms in the nation of whoredoms. And we're talking about idolaters here. People who have gone after other gods. But I love the story of Hosea and Gomer because, man, it's my story. It is my story. I'm not Gomer. Well, I am Gomer in this story. <laughs> Goober, he said. Huh? But after they were married, you know, she ends up leaving Hosea for another man. But she belonged to Hosea. Remember that. She was married to Hosea and that... She was his wife, but she becomes this an adulterer. And this is a picture of not only Gomer, but of Israel and a picture of all of us today. We are Gomer. Hosea, or should I say Gomer, belonged to Hosea. Folks, when we come into this world, we are gods because God is creator. We're his now, don't, I don't want you to think I'm going some type of uh, uh, heresy in the church. Everything belongs to God. <laughs> Everything does. The farthest uni uh, stars on the other side of the universe belong to him. And when you came into this world, he is creator. All things belong to him. Keep that in mind as well. We belong to God. He is the creator. But get this, church. We, like Gomer, once we've grown up, we have left that Hosea in our life and has decided to find us another. Y'all right. going to get so tired of hearing this from me. But people are looking for love in all the wrong places. People have been hurt and damaged, and they're still looking for love. 
They're looking for it over there and in this part of their life or in this part over here of their life. They're trying to find love in a person, trying to find love in a job. You're trying to find love in an animal. Church, can I tell you today, the only way you're going to find love is to find Jesus. He is love. That's what John said. John said, God is love. And if you're looking for love, you need to start there. I think I told y'all before in the last couple of weeks, or I may have told you last two weeks, listen, my wife couldn't love me until she loved God. She could take, take care of me and those kinds of things and be concerned about me, but true love can only be expressed when we have met true love ourselves. <laughs> and Beth's true love ain't me, church. True love for Beth was God. My true love is not Beth. My true love is God. And that's the way it is. But we're just like Gomer where we have turned away from the one who loved us, who we were a part of, and we have began to love another. And that other that we're talking about is sin, self, and the world. You have begun to love this, this place we call the planet Earth and all it has to offer. We have begun falling in love with other things, and other things have become God in our life. If I had a dollar bill on me, I could hold it up, and there's so many people are bowing to the almighty dollar. I want to throw this in. This is not part of the message, but I think it's a good time to throw this in. It will cost you nothing, okay? But when you go in the voting booth to pull a ballot for someone, you don't worry about what they can do for the economy. You give me somebody who is moral and is one of upright character. I'll choose him over anybody else or her. Don't make no difference to me. Give me more morality and an upright character. and That's the person I'll pull. Because if he's moral and upright, he's going to do the right thing. Okay? I'm not looking for a pastor in chief. If I was looking for a pastor in chief in America, I'd run for office myself. But I ain't looking for no pastor in chief. But, you know, here we are. We've left him for another. But this is where the crazy love of God, the redeeming love of God comes into play for us this morning. He says that he has this redeeming love. And the first thing we see, and we're going to have to do this again, on your outline, Roman numeral number one, so everybody can keep up, is redeeming love gives pursuit. It gives pursuit. Now we all know what pursuit is. I know some of you have probably been pursued by the law before speeding. <laughs> and we all have, we understand what it means to pursue, right? And I know all of us at some point have pursued someone of the opposite sex in our life at some point in our life. You have pursued after them. But I want you to know this morning that you have a God who loves you with such a crazy love that he has pursued you from the time even before you were conceived, God was pursuing you. Yes, amen. Yeah. So, well, preacher, that sounds kind of crazy. One of the greatest stories we're seeing here about Hosea, God uses Hosea and Gomer to express this love. And we see that Jesus, capital A on your outline, Jesus has pursued you and me in our sinful lifestyles. Now get this, church. You don't get cleaned up to come to God. You come to God to get cleaned up. Huh? If you got to get cleaned up before you come, you ain't coming. I wouldn't be here. <laughs> I couldn't get cleaned up enough in order to come to God. God says, you know what, that, how that sign used to put it out there? You catch them, God cleans them. That's right. That's the truth. You bring them in, God will do the work. But we got to be faithful in our part. Amen. So Jesus has pursued you and I in our sinful lifestyles. You say, well, pastor, I've never had a sinful lifestyle. Liar. You're sinful right there. You've lied. We all have had sinful lifestyles. Huh? I want you to let, we all know Psalm 23, right? <clears throat> we all know that passage. In Psalm 23, verse 6, I want you to 
Listen to the Amplified version of this. He says in the Amplified, Surely are only goodness and mercy, comma, and unfailing love, I put redeeming love, shall follow me, I added the word pursue, all the days of my life. Listen, church, read this. Surely only goodness and mercy, unfailing love, redeeming love shall follow me or pursue me all the days of my life. God is pursuing us every single day. Yes, amen. And it's not like us, guys, when we catch a woman and get married, we stop pursuing. God continually pursues even after he catches us. Come on, ladies, y'all know that. We're in the month of love, yes? But I wish my husband would pursue after me every once in a while. The pursuit don't need to stop, guys. My wife's not in here, so I can say that, but when she sees this, she's going to be talking about, hey, Amen! <laughs> you need to be pursuing me. Practice what you preach, preacher. But listen, we need to be pursued. We need to pursue our wives because God has pursued us. He has pursued me. It's not after he catches me, he says, all right, I've caught you, it's done. No, he says, Paul, I'm pursuing you for a more intimate relationship. I want us to get more intimate every single day. He wants us to get to the point that we get sometimes in our relationships that when, when you've been married a long time, uh, one or the other of you can begin saying something, the other finishes it. And when you say something, that other looks at you and says, wow, I was just thinking the same thing. You know, we get to that point in our relationship sometimes, and it's great. God wants that with us. He wants us to be in such a tight, intimate relationship with each other that when God begins to say something, we can finish it up. He wants us to be so in love with him like he's in love with us that when God's will, we know it and we're doing it. Boy, God's love is a redeeming love, though. It's in pursuit of us. Think about <clears throat> this pursuit. You say, well, how is this true? Well, Matthew chapter 18, verse 12. I didn't put these on there, so you've got to write them down and go look them up. He says this, How think ye, if a man have a hundred sheep... And one of them goes astray. Doth he not leave the ninety and nine and go into the mountains and seek of that which has gone astray? That, my friends, is crazy love. He left the ninety and nine to go get the one that was missing. That's a pursuing God. That's a God with redeeming love, a crazy love, that he would leave the 90 and 9 that was secure and safe to come out and get me and you. Because we were the one at one point in time. But God has left the 90 and 9 to come do, to find us. How does God pursue us? Well, I'm glad you asked. Because you did, didn't you? How does God pursue us? I'm beginning to. I know that sounds terrible <clears throat> when you're guzzling. How has God pursued us? The first way we see is in creation. God has pursued us in creation. He personally created you and me for intimate relationship. He has created us for this intimate relationship. Go to Psalm 139. Don't. <clears throat> Just write it down. But we see in that passage where God, he says, man, I knew you. Before you and you in your mother's womb, but while you were in your mother's womb, I was knitting you together. I was in the nursery inside your mama, making sure everything going to, to the right place. I loved you. I wrote all your members down in my book before you were even born. Wow. That's a God that pursues, isn't it? Yes. I'm putting her to the test, brother. Incarnation. In the incarnation, we see that God pursues us. The Father revealed through his Son his living word. Jesus. Jesus is that love. Jesus came to pursue us, and that excites me. 
It excites me to no end. But then we see in the inspiration of the Word, God loved us with such a great love. Not only did He send the living Word, He's given us the written Word inspired by the Holy Spirit to write the Word out so that we'll have it, we'll read it, and know more about Him. You want to know the character of God? Don't wait for an audible voice. Get your butt in the Bible and read it. There it is. <laughs> Too many preachers going to use that type of language, I don't think, but that's all right. <clears throat> We're getting it across, amen? amen? Then we see his love. He pursued us by the cross. He died for us while we were yet sinners. Jesus died for me. Even though he knew I was going to get out of the world and be an adulterer, I was going to go after false gods, I was going to live a life of a sinner, yet Jesus still came and died for me. Hallelujah. What love. How many of us, with a show of hands, would marry someone knowing that they're going to go out and be an adulterer or an adulteress? Let me see your hand. If you knew it was going to happen, you wouldn't marry that person. When you get married, you hope it doesn't happen. But let me tell you something. Jesus, he came and died on a cross knowing that you, my friend, would be an adulterer and an adulteress. He knew it, yet he still came. He is the bridegroom, my friends, and we are the bride. He said, I'm going to come and die for this church and for this bride no matter what. No matter what the occasion, I'm going to come and do it. But on the cross, he expressed it. He expressed his pursuit of us. Then we see adoption. You know, he chose to adopt us as sons and daughters. Then we have the indwelling spirit. God sent his spirit after Jesus came and uh, ascended back to heaven. Then he sends the Holy Spirit to indwell within us. He's constantly pursuing us. Folks, I cannot imagine a world without the Holy Spirit. Amen. But I guarantee you one day there's going to be a period of seven years where the Holy Spirit will not be on this planet and all hell is going to break loose. Amen. Right now we've got the Spirit of God keeping total evil <clears throat> at bay. Boy, there's spit flying everywhere. Be careful, Destiny. There's going to be a period where God's not here. And total evil is going to be unleashed. Amen. Folks, that's called the tribulation. You don't want to be here. Amen. Come on. Amen. You don't. You want to get saved right now if you're not saved. Because it could happen in the next five minutes. The church is gone. And you're still here. Then you're going to have to live through hell. You more than likely will die. Just saying odds are you're going to die in the tribulation. If you're here, get right now. Not only in the indwelling spirit, we also have the new covenant that God's given us. We see him pursuing us and saying, listen, I don't, I'm tired. I'm tired of y'all having to continually sacrifice to try to cover your sin. I'm going to send blood that will eradicate sin out of your life, the perfect blood of Jesus Christ. And we see that in this new covenant. We've been talking about that for like 10 years on Wednesday nights. <laughs> Study of Hebrews. Huh? We've been talking about it. But also we have the, the sanctification. God didn't want to just come and save us and leave us to ourselves. He said, I want to give you victory. We get victory over sin, church. You need to start walking in it. So many times, right, we think about our kids when they go to camp. We've talked about this as adults. We were the same way as kids, I guess. But, you know, they go to camp, man, they get fired up. Boy, they worship Jesus. They experience God in a fresh new way. And all of a sudden, they come back to the church, and they get a little excited in church. And the parents talk about, hey, calm down over there, okay? Don't get too excited about Jesus. We we'll just kind of keep him under wraps over here just a little bit. And then all of a sudden, when they're back in the world again, they didn't have victory throughout the year. They go back to camp, experience them again, and then we come back, the cycle continues. Amen. But listen to me, church. He gave us victory. He has pursued us to not only save us, but to give us victory. Yes, Ooh, glory. Amen. I'm glad he did. Amen. Yes. All right, let's look at B. <clears throat> Roman numeral number one. And don't worry, they're not all that long, okay? <laughs> 
Some of y'all thinking, dear Lord, he's going to keep us here till the night. We see Gomer. <laughs> oh, Gomer. Gomer is a picture of what we're like. That's us. Jesus came to marry us, and we walk off out there in the sinful world. Find us another fella. Find us someone where we think the grass is greener on the other side. Oh, my goodness, folks. The grass ain't ever greener on the other side. What tickles me sometimes, I've talked with people before who said this. Walk into my office. <clears throat> you know, preacher, I just don't love her no more. <laughs> really? I don't think you loved her to begin with. <laughs> okay? I'm just saying because when you fall in love, you don't fall out of love. They may have hurt you, but you ain't fallen out of love. If that's the case, then I prove my point with the Scriptures that God falls out of love with us. Ain't, God ain't falling out of love with us, folks. Don't matter what we do. What you need to do if, if you're coming to see me, because some of you now are talking about, I ain't going to see that crazy joker. Huh? <laughs> Come here talking about, I fell out of love with my husband, or I fell out of love with my wife. What you need to do is fall back in love with them. Huh? That's, you need to fall back in love with them. Find Jesus, fall back in love. That's what we need to be doing. But listen, Romans 5, 8 says that while, uh, but God commended his love toward us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. We've covered that and hammered it home. Even though God knew you were going to walk out into the world, he said, I'm still going to send my son, my most precious gift, the one I love since eternity past. I'm going to send him to die for you. Man. Thank you. All right, look at Roman numeral number two. Whoo. Is it hot in here to y'all? Yes, praise God. I'm glad I got some people on my side. Redeeming love makes purchase. Redeeming love makes purchase. Now, we all know what it is to make a purchase, right? All go to the store, you buy something, you make purchase. Redeeming love purchases us. I want you to understand that. It's important because in the life of, of Gomer, we're going to see that exactly happening. Hosea had to make purchase of something that was already his. Gomer was his, yet she went out in the world and became a slave to sin. And then she got put up on the, the block to be sold. Gomer had to go, I mean, Hosea had to go and buy something that already belonged to him. How would you like to have your car paid for and then have to turn around and go buy it again? Really, if that's the case, I'll give you a payment book. <laughs> but we know that Gomer's price was 15 pieces of silver and a homer and half of barley. We're not going to break all that down what that means. Right now, to me, that's insignificant of what the price is for her. But I want us to talk about what it cost. What do we cost? What is our cost? <clears throat> 1 Corinthians chapter 6, 19 and 20. I'm going to break this down a little bit where it's not, I'm not reading the whole thing. But Paul said this in 19, the latter part of verse 19. He said, you are not your own. <laughs> you see, when, when God came to purchase you, you no longer belong to you. You're not your own, he said. And in verse 20, he said, you are bought with a price. Listen, we are bought with a price. We are no longer our own. And if you are going to walk as a believer on this planet, then don't go in this time to start acting like it. Come on. Yes. Understand that we are not our own. Listen, my wife, when we got had to use ours as an example, <clears throat> plus she's not in here thinking she's in the nursery. <laughs> but listen, when she and I got married, <laughs> she's no longer her own. She's mine. I'm no longer my own. I'm hers. That's it. I'm no longer mine. I've been bought with a price when it comes to, to this spiritual thing. God said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to purchase you. Sorry about the spit. 1 Peter 1.18, for as much as you know that you were not redeemed, there's that word, with corruptible things as silver and gold, but with the precious blood 
of Jesus Christ. Woo! A lamb without blemish and without spot. Listen to what they're say, uh, Luke says over in Acts chapter 20, uh, verse 28. He said, take their... Take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock over which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers to feed the church of God which he hath purchased, that's King James, purchased with his own blood. You and I have been purchased with the most valuable commodity in the universe. <laughs> it ain't gold. It ain't silver. It ain't the almighty dollar. It's not the yen. It's not the peso. <laughs> it's the blood of Jesus. Church, there's nothing greater than the blood of Jesus. There's nothing greater. We could put all of our resources together on this planet, and it would not even begin to equal one little teeny tiny drip of the blood of Jesus. Folks, listen, the blood of Jesus has purchased us. He has purchased us with the, the blood of Jesus. And I pray today that all of you have experienced that purchase. If you haven't, you need to experience it this morning. You need to experience what it's like to be bought with the blood of Jesus. Because you'll never be the same. Listen, number three, Roman numeral number three. Redeeming love has a purpose. I want you to get this this morning now. Hosea didn't redeem Gomer so that she could go back in to that lifestyle, church. <laughs> There's a purpose behind this redeeming love. And what we know is that in, in Roman numeral number A, God didn't redeem us so that we could continue in sin. Get this, because everybody says, once you get saved, you're going, you're going to sin and fall. Don't believe that life in the pit of hell. You may, but you don't have to. Right. Too many times I read in the Bible it says, if we sin, if we sin, if we sin. Right. <laughs> okay, so there's a possibility if there's an if we sin, there's a possibility if we don't. Okay? But the, listen to Paul. what Paul says in Romans chapter 6. I love what he says there. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? <laughs> God forbid... How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Glory to God. Amen. Amen. How shall we? If we are in Christ and we are dead to sin, why are we still living that, that Gomer lifestyle? Why are we still there? God said, I loved you with this redeeming love. I want to purchase this for you. And when I purchase this for you, you no longer have to go back. So when somebody comes up to you and says, you have to sin in thought, word every day, thought, word, and deed every day, you tell them they're liars. You don't have to. Now, number B, the redeeming love of God transforms us into a new creation. Hmm. The Apostle Paul again, I like that guy, 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things become new. Oh, hallelujah. Thank you, Lord, for that purpose in our life. And then number C, we see the redeeming love's purpose is not only to save us from eternal destruction, that is hell, but also to deliver us from this present sin. I believe God sent his son into the world to not only die, to, to help us escape the, the, the eternity of hell, but I believe that the blood of Jesus, and it is able to cleanse us from the, uh, the sinful effects of the sin nature. It's not that this body will, el will ever be perfect, but I don't know how much more perfect this body can get, right? Amen? All right. All right. <clears throat> but I mean, what I'm saying is the sin, the sin nature inside of us. People say, well, God can't eradicate it. I believe he does. He can get you to the point where you so hate sin that when you're tempted, you run. Amen. Right. It makes you sick on your stomach like a virus. Sin, you sin, all of a sudden you just start getting sick. Oh, my goodness. 
Paul had a lot to say about that, but I don't have time to cover it this morning. But God understands the struggle this morning, church. He understands the struggle of this present life. He sent his son into the world to be a representative of the Godhead in humanity. He understands. He lived it. God will not zap you to end the struggle, even though sometimes we wish he would. He doesn't do it. But he's accomplished all the hard work that you and I have. Amen. And God thought enough of you to send his own son to purchase your freedom. I don't believe there's anything, nothing in this world that amazes me more than the love of God. This redeeming love, I mean, nothing in this world amazes me like that. To think that there's a God who has created me, loves me with such a crazy love that he was willing to, to die for me. Folks, can I tell you something this morning? I love each and every one of you. And I'd like to think that I would die for you. But odds are I probably wouldn't. But Jesus did. Jesus died for you to redeem you. This morning, we're going to open up this altar. And I don't know where you are in your life. Maybe you've experienced that love. Maybe you haven't. But we're going to invite you to come. If you haven't, come down here and experience the love of God. If you have, and maybe you know someone that needs to experience it, Lord, <laughs> All things are accomplished through prayer. Amen? Let's pray that people experience the redeeming love of God. Let's stand together. Father, today, we thank you, Lord, for this redeeming love. Father, I wasn't worthy <clears throat> to experience it, but you still came and did it anyway. And I thank you today, Lord, that that you have loved us, everyone in this building, this sanctuary. You love them with a redeeming love. And Father, we ask this morning that all of us have experienced it ourselves. Lord, if there just be one who hasn't, I pray, God, that during this song, Lord, that they will bow their heads and all they have to do is cry out to you because your word says that you have loved us with a redeeming love to save us from destruction. Lord, I pray this morning they will experience it. Father, we love you. We pray now that you would speak to our hearts in Jesus' name. And you